everybody. Good morning for those of you guys joining us from the U.S. And good evening if you're joining us from China or elsewhere in Asia. Good to see everybody. Uh, for those of you guys that are able to, it'd be great if you could turn on your webcam um, just so that we can see some faces so we're not just talking to a wall of blank screens and random names. It's always good to be able to put some faces uh, to names here um, <clears throat> as we're still uh, getting getting back to in person, but it's still great to be able to do these uh, Zoom meetings and uh, be able to connect from people all over the world. Uh, so my name is Devin Lau. I am the Associate Director of Yale Center Beijing, and I'm very glad today to have you guys join us for uh, a talk on a new book by Professor Alex Kavak on uh, a very pertinent and relevant uh, topic that I'm sure uh, in this increasing age of uh, polarization and extreme views um, is is uh, more more important than than ever um, and so very excited to have you all join us uh, let me quickly introduce our speaker and then we'll get right to it um, so professor um, alex kapak is associate professor of political science at yale as well as a resident fellow of the institution for social policy studies and the center for the study of american politics after completing his bachelor's at the university of chicago he received his phd in political science from columbia university his principal interests research as uh, um, I said earlier, lies in political persuasion and its implications for the malleability of public opinion, especially in the context of elections, uh, which is, of course, the subject of his new book and today's talk. Uh, but he's also the co-author of Research Design in the Social Sciences, Declare, Diagnose, Redesign, uh, which is a research design textbook that introduces a language for describing research design and an algorithm for evaluating the properties. So for those of you that are in political science or uh, interested in more of the uh, uh, nuts and bolts of, of his work, uh, that's, I think, also an uh, interesting topic he'd be willing to discuss. Um, and so... Lots of uh, interesting things to talk about today. So I'm just going to turn it over to him and then uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Devin. Uh, thanks to Yale Center Beijing for, for inviting me to come talk to you about this. Um, this book has been such a long time coming. It was my, it was my dissertation work uh, seven years ago. And at the time, I was uh, just so focused on on the empirical findings that I did not really take, um, even though my advisors were telling me to, I, I didn't really take the uh, step backwards to understand what it what it all means for politics. Um, so now I can, you know, it's finally in print and I can wave it at you and that's really exciting for me. Um, but um, I, I also have had in the intervening seven years when uh, rewriting it from the very beginning and uh, re-encountering all of the experiments, um, I've had a an opportunity now to to really understand what it does mean for politics. And so what I, I hope that I can do in this talk is give you a sense of, um, you know, the main claim, how I came to that main claim, but also what it does mean for, for politics uh, more generally. Um, I'm going to focus the talk around uh, three key ideas, and so uh, if you're if you, if you come along with me for the first key idea, um, I think then you'll be happy to go along to the second. And if you're okay with one and two, then you might be okay with the third idea. Um, but you're under no obligation. So if you if you <laughs> you don't agree, um, that that's okay. Um, I'm happy to answer questions throughout if they come up for you, or we can save them to the end. Um, it's it's totally up to you. Okay, um, I'll share screen uh, now. Let's see. Oh no, you're going to get to see the whole talk. One second. All right. So that first idea, that first key idea is that the persuasion and parallel pattern is common. I'm trying to say that what normally happens when people encounter politi persuasive political information is that they change their minds a little bit in the direction of information, and that that change, that 
change in their attitudes is similar for different groups. And so um, if you were to make a picture of what that looks like, it looks like parallel lines. So this persuasion and parallel pattern is the thing that I'm claiming is general. Now, of course, that, that has to be an overclaim because I have only studied people in the US who might take surveys. So I'm trying to generalize that claim to people in the US who might not take surveys and to people who live in Canada who might and might not take surveys and people who live in France, people who live in Argentina and indeed in China and people who live in the 23rd century and the people who live in the 16th century. Like I'm trying to make a general claim um, about what happens when people encounter persuasive information. But of course, I've only studied the people that I did do that I did study, right? So that generalization is going to be have to be made not on the basis of an actual empirical finding, but instead on the basis of the theoretical generalization. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll be willing to come with me on that particular uh, on that particular journey. Let me take show you a picture of what the persuasion and parallel pattern looks like. This is a stylized version. So these are not data. This is the this is a schematic version. Imagine that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are blue people and there are red people, and they disagree on average about some policy. So the vertical axis of this figure is policy support. And you can see that the blue people on average support the policy at a higher rate than the red people. And that's when you don't give them any persuasive information. If we go over to the right side of the graph, now this is what happens when you give positive Positive persuasive information, that is to say, facts and argumentation that has a target attitude that you're trying to move in the positive direction. So for people who are in the blue group, that information is congenial, like they already agree and they like that information. They move in the direction of information and support the policy even more. For people who are in the red group, that group is counter attitudinal. They don't like that information. But nevertheless, they update in the direction of information. My argument is fully symmetric. So if you were to instead see negative persuasive information, you would move in the negative direction. And that would be so that would be pro attitudinal for the people who are in the red group, but it would be counter attitudinal for people who are in the blue group. So that's just that's the that's the persuasion parallel pattern in a nutshell. That's what I'm trying to claim is commonplace is that uh, people update their views in the direction of information by a small amount. And it's not different for the red blue group and the blue group, right? That's the, in, the key thing is that there is a central similarity in the way that people respond to political information. Let me say a couple of other comments about this figure, about what is included in the argument and what is excluded. So I'm only talking about treatments that you could put on this axis, on the horizontal axis. Other kinds of treatments are not persuasive information. So for example, a group Q is not persuasive political information. A group Q is like what some other group in society thinks. So in the US context, you might say, Republicans support the policy. And then the causal effect of that on Republican respondents, I am, um, views is going to be in to increase their support, but among Democrats, that would be to decrease their support. So you get oppositely signed treatment effects of that kind of a group Q treatment. So that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about persuasive information. There I'm talking about like trying to make an argument to change your mind on a particular issue using facts and logic and argumentation. Another important thing is what is what is scoped in on this vertical axis? What are the kinds of outcome variables that we're talking about? And that's going to be anything that can be construed as a policy support variable, not other things that are sometimes measured in these persuasion experiments, like um, how much you like the information or how much you like the speaker, right? So those sorts of evaluations are not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking instead about policy support. Okay. Let me give you an example of persuasion in parallel from one of these experiments. This is a study done by Chong and Druckmann in 2010 in the US. 
the, uh, the, the policy area we're studying here is support for the Patriot Act, which was a policy um, introduced after 9-11. Republicans, when you don't do anything for, to them, they support the policy at a higher rate than do Democrats. If you give them pro-information, so these were six arguments in a row that the subjects were exposed to six arguments about why the Patriot Act is so good, why we should support the Patriot Act. It's going to keep us safer in the in a dangerous world. We're going to beat the terrorists, etc. And when Republicans are exposed to that information, they increase their support for the Patriot Act, and so do Democrats. So Democrats are also persuaded, just like Republicans, by about the same amount. There is a alternative treatment condition to which subjects could be randomly assigned, and that was to get six arguments about why the Patriot Act is very bad. It impinges upon our personal freedoms, it's um, a violation of privacy, et cetera. That causes Democrats to decrease their support for the Patriot Act, but also for Republicans. So that was the original study conducted by Chong and Druckmann uh, before 2010, I don't know, maybe 2008, I came along in graduate school and simply redid the study on a new sample. So this is the Mechanical Turk sample. Mechanical Turk is a service provided by Amazon where you can essentially get uh, like online workers to take surveys. It's completely unrepresentative of the national population, right? They're just weirdos on the internet. Uh, and you can see that they have different average, like the Republicans on Mechanical Turk have a different average opinion from the Republicans in the national probability sample. Even so, on Mechanical Turk, the treatments had very similar effects. So the Republicans on Mechanical Turk updated their opinions in line with the treatments that they saw. If you saw the pro-treatment, you became more pro. If you saw the con-treatment, you became more con. There's actually three instances of the persuasion and parallel pattern in this figure. You've got the persuasion and parallel pattern on the left-hand side. You've got the persuasion and parallel on the right-hand side. And also you have one where you can see that people who are mechanical Turkers respond to this information and people who are not mechanical Turkers respond to this information by about the same amount, right? So that's to say, this is one of the um, research design implications of this work is you can't use like these online convenience samples to do descriptive research. You're gonna get the wrong answer about the level of opinion because of all of the normal um, sampling bias things that we are taught in introductory statistics class, right? Mechanical triggers are not representative of the population, absolutely. But for the kinds of things we study in survey experiments, when we're studying the causal effects of treatments, those are typically quite similar from person to person. And so that's the reason why you can study those things on non-representative samples and still learn something about human beings in general, right? And so that's the, like, I'm giving you the substantive talk today, but there is a whole um, research design side of this, which takes advantage of the fact that when you know that the treatment effects are gonna be relatively homogeneous, you can generalize from one sample to another, even though there's no design-based reason for that. Okay, so the the book is um, is about uh, it's twenty three of those kinds of experiments. Okay, and so chapter five of the book is extraordinarily boring. It's like a justification over and over and over again of why that experiment counts on the horizontal axis and why that experiment counts on the vertical axis. And so it's just like a slog to get through all of those experiments. I am just, it would be very boring for you and it would be very boring for me for me to go through all 23 of those experiments. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flash on the screen the picture that shows up from all of them. So you get a sense of, of how parallel and how commonplace this parallel persuasion finding is. Let me pull that up. So here's chapter five of the book. 
Here's an experiment where people update in parallel approximately. Here's another experiment where people update in parallel. Here's more parallelism. This is the one we were just looking at. That's the Patriot Act experiment. Here's some more parallelism. Still more. This one, the negative treatment was more powerful than the positive treatment, but you can see that it's still similar across different groups from the left and the right. This page is just nothing but parallel lines. So is this one. So is that one. So are these. So is that. Okay, that's it. So the, the point of showing you all of those things was to very briefly uh, convince you that across this set of experiments that includes some experiments that I did with collaborators, others where I was replicating somebody else's work on a new sample, um, and a third set where I had, I, I was just like, I need some more persuasion experiments. And there's this, um, there's this organization called TESS, where if you get a grant from TESS, you get to run your survey experiment on a representative sample. But the requirement is that the data from that experiment be posted online. So I just downloaded a whole bunch of persuasion experiments and showed that it is also true in those ones. In no way am I trying to say that I have like sampled at random from the set of possible persuasion experiments. Um, I, I, there's no design, but, and it's not a, it's not in any way like all of the ones that have ever been done. If I were to redo this study now, I would choose a different set of 23 <laughs> experiments to do. Um, I'm gratified to know, know that when I look at persuasion experiments now that the book is you know printed and all the rest of it and I look at new ones I, I keep finding the same pattern um I was talking to a Chinese scholar uh earlier this week and he showed me his persuasion experiment and then like by people who are predisposed to support the government and people who are predisposed uh, predisposed to oppose the government you see very similar uh treatment effects of information um in even in the chinese context so it, this is not something that is specific to american people uh this is a feature of human beings or or so i claim um that that people are persuaded a small amount in the direction of information and that and that's not i'm not trying to um confine that finding to any particular policy area or to any particular person or to any particular way to divide up the subgroups. It's a general finding. I look forward to in the future people <laughs> people finding exceptions to that. Um, and that's that's the way that this goes. But what's important, I think, is to instead of focusing on all the ways that we're different, we should focus on the ways in which we are quite similar. And we are quite similar in our um susceptibility to to persuasive information okay i'm going to go back to sharing and i'm going to give you a a way to summarize all that information that's slightly different from just flashing those pictures at you okay so this figure is a way of looking at all of the experiments all at once I'm going to take each experiment and standardize it so that the effects are expressed not in whatever scale happened in that experiment, but instead in standardized units I've divided by the standard deviation in the control group so that now we can understand a treatment effect um, in terms of like how many, what, what fraction of a standard deviation have we moved people. The horizontal axis on this figure is the average treatment effect among people who call themselves Democrats. The vertical axis is that same thing, the effect, uh, the average effective information among people who call themselves Republicans. And what you can see from this figure is that when Democrats have a large treatment effect, so too do Republicans, right? So they're very, it's, they share that. When they have a middling treatment effect, so too do Republicans. That's just to say that the treatment effects across all of these experiments are quite correlated in the sense that 
Whatever the effect is going to be for Democrats, that's what you're going to find for Republicans. And the reason is that both of them have effects that are quite similar to the overall average effect, right? This is just to say that the effects are quite homogeneous by partisanship. If I do the same thing by racial group, so now on the horizontal axis, I have the effect of treatment among white respondents correlated with the effect of treatment among black respondents, you can see that this scatter plot is less tightly correlated. And there's a very clear understanding of, of why that's the case. There are far fewer black respondents in these samples than there are white respondents. So the confidence intervals in the vertical direction are quite noisy, whereas the confidence intervals in the horizontal direction are quite tight. And there's a that just creates attenuation in a correlation. So that that's a straightforward consequence of the different amounts of measurement error that we're seeing from the racial comparison versus the partisanship comparison. Now we can look at this pattern by six different ways of dividing up the population. So we had partisanship and race. We can also look at ideology. We could look at gender, we could look at age, we could look at education. In all of these cases, we've got good evidence that the effects are correlated. If it's larger for one subgroup, it's also going to be larger for the other subgroup. The correlation is tighter when, the, when those things are estimated with more precision, and it's less tight when that's estimated with less precision. So that's just to say any differences that we're seeing by these covariates it's just a straightforward consequence of, of having less information about those people. So it is this picture that convinces me that the persuasion and parallel pattern is common. And that's the basis on which I'm trying to convince you that the persuasion and parallel pattern is common. Um, I don't have any further proof uh, for you um, than what is in this figure. So this is like, here ends the empirical portion of the talk. Um, if you're not convinced now, like I, I won't be able to, to convince you further because I have no more information to do that, do that with. Okay. Now, I don't know whether I have convinced you, but suppose that I have. Suppose that you now believe uh, that the persuasion and parallel pattern is common. Then your next question is like, so, okay, so Alex, you say that it's common, but like, why don't we see it all the time if it is? And I'm going to give you three, I'm going to give you three explanations for this. And the first is in order to see the persuasion in parallel pattern, you need to have a randomized experiment. You need to see units in their untreated condition, and you need to see units in their treated condition. If you don't have that, then you can't draw the lines between what people would say on average if they weren't treated and what they would say on average if they were. What do we have instead? We have repeated cross-sectional polls of the same people, or sorry, we have repeated cross-sectional polls of the same kinds of people. So this is a figure that displays attitudes towards gay marriage in the US by seven different ways to divide up the population partisanship, ideology, religion, religious attendance, race, generation, gender. In all of these subgroups, people went from not supporting gay marriage as much to supporting gay marriage at a much higher level. And they do that in parallel for basically all of these lines, right? So even those who really do not support gay marriage, white evangelical Protestants, for example, they have a very low level of support even they, they increase their support for gay marriage over the course of this period. People who have very high support, so liberal Democrats, they increase their support even more during this time. So you can find instances of this parallel public's finding. This is a classic finding in the political science literature that many, many issues have this feature. Here's an example of a, of a issue where they do not have that feature. Um, I did not know before starting this research that, uh, you know, in the 80s, Democrats and Republicans had the same average opinions about whether or not people should be allowed to have abortions. Over the course of this period, the Democrats and Republicans have absolutely split and diverged in their opinions. And there are other issues like this too. Immigration, for example, 
immigration attitudes have diverged over time, not moved in parallel. So this kind of information about, about people's attitudes, I argue you can't use it to understand whether or not it's the case that people update their views in the direction of information in a similar amount. So you can't use this information to study the question that I'm trying to study. And the reason is that what's the treatment variable in these graphs? It's time, right? And so many things move with time, not just information. So we don't really know what the treatment is. We also don't know that people who are Democrats and people who are Republicans are getting the same treatment Right, they could be getting exposed to different information. That's a, another possibility. And a third problem is that the kinds of people who call themselves Republicans now are different from the kinds of people who call themselves Republicans before. Right, so there's generational replacement. There's also been wild changes in party leadership. And so some people have selected out of calling themselves Republicans and some people have selected in. And so there's no sense in which it's the same people over time in these graphs, right? It's just the set of people who call themselves Democrats and Republicans. So that's all to say, I, it's not like I think that public poll, you know, public opinion polling like this is not useful. It's just, it does not tell us about the causal effects of information. For that, you need an experiment. And then there's a third reason. And this third reason is more of a sociological critique of our discipline of political science, which is that suppose you do your experiment and you look at the average effect. Ah, fantastic. You've got statistical significance. You have shown that your persuasive treatment does in fact move attitudes. Then someone in the audience will say, well, that's nice, but is it different for different kinds of people, right? They'll, they'll raise that question. Perhaps you've been in an audience when someone has raised such a question. Uh, perhaps you've asked such a question yourself. Um, the researcher, they go they back to their office and very dutifully run that regression where you check to see whether or not the effects are different for those two. And, it, and it's not, right? It doesn't happen. Then that analysis somehow doesn't make it into the paper. It doesn't make it into the press release. It doesn't make it into the way that people talk about the experiment. Like if anything, it ends up as a footnote in the paper. Ah, and we checked for heterogeneity by this, that, and the other thing, we didn't find anything, right? So the fact of homogeneity is always an, is, is frequently an afterthought uh, for researchers. Like when you discover homogeneity, you don't make the paper about that. It's only when you find differences in treatment effects that you like make a whole new theoretical section to explain that difference. I think that this is a pathology of our discipline to do it that way. Instead, we should be focusing on the ways in which people are similar since what we're trying to do is learn generalizable things about people. So I don't have any proof uh, that, that that's the reason why uh, we don't see the persuasion in parallel pattern, but uh, that's my intuition is that it, there's a sociological problem. Um, I'm going to not discuss these design objections in detail, um, but you might have concerns that these experiments somehow don't um, answer the question as, um, as we've described. So like some of those parallel lines aren't exactly parallel. I've got a, there's like a defense of that, which is that um, you really have to believe very strongly in your measurement technique that like a move from two to three is exactly equal to a move from five to six. Like, like essentially in someone's heart that that measurement really reflects exactly the same thing. And I'm un unwilling to make that, uh, to make that claim uh, too strongly. You might say, well, Alex, congratulations. You have um, looked at six covariates, but that's not the relevant one. You have to look at some further way that human beings differ from each other. So there's always a new proposal for some difference between people that will explain why they are more or less persuadable. Um, I, I don't know that I have measured the correct X. It's not possible for me to know that because it's an infinite. It's like always another one that uh, you could ask. You could be worried about um, measurement error in these experiments. Like what if people know what you're after and so then they um, they just give you the answer that you want to hear. So so-called demand effects, or perhaps people are um, uh, 
shy and are worried about embarrassment. And so then they don't tell you the truth about what they think. They instead give you um, the what they think you want to hear. Um, so both of those are possible. Um, I don't have any proof that they're not happening. I, all I have is indirect evidence from other domains where when we look for that kind of a problem, we look for demand effects, we look for sensitivity bias, um, we are unable to, to, to demonstrate that it would be a problem in a setting like this. So I don't know for sure, but it's not like I'm unaware of the problem. Okay. Let me move on now to the second key idea. Thus far, what I've been talking about is the effect of persuasive information on policy attitudes, what I'm gonna call Z1 on Y1. I wanna distinguish persuasive information from another kind of treatment, which is group cues. Again, like I said earlier, group cues are are treatments that tell you not, not why you should support a policy. Here's the reasons why. Instead, it's what somebody else in society thinks. And group cues absolutely generate differently signed treatment effects for different people. So for an in-group member, an in-group cue is going to increase their support for the policy. For an out-group member, um, that same cue will decrease their support for the policy. There's all kinds of interesting work to be done on group cues. Like, we have overlapping identities. We're like we have many different groups that we're members of. Is it the case that you can be cued by any group that you're a member of? Does it depend on the strength of your attachment to that group? Are there some groups that you allow to speak for politics and other groups that you don't? Right? These are the these are questions that we don't know the answers to just yet. But it's really important, even though we don't know the answers to those questions, it's really important to distinguish this kind of treatment from that kind of treatment. Because if, if, if someone set, comes to me, Alex, I did an experiment, I found oppositely signed treatment effects, you're wrong, people aren't persuaded in parallel, but it's actually a group Q treatment, then we haven't actually uh, shown that it's not true that people update their views in parallel to persuasive political information. Okay, so that's a treatment distinction I wanna make. Now, an outcome distinction I wanna make is drawing a distinction between people's policy attitude. That's the thing that the persuasive information is trying to change from something I'm calling an affective evaluation. That means how much you like the person who's telling you that, how much you like the message that you're saying. Like, do you, do you think that it is high quality? Do you think that it is unbiased? Do you think that it is persuasive? All of these things that other measurements are about rating that treatment and rating that messenger. The effects of persuasive information on those ratings are also heterogeneous. If you are the kind of person who likes the information, then your affective evaluation goes up when you see it. But if you dislike the information, your affective evaluation goes down, right? Many people who have been trying to study the effects of persuasion have mistaken the effects on affective evaluations for the effects on policy attitudes. Like, ah, people reject information with which they disagree. No, 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 no. People criticize information with which they disagree. That doesn't mean that they reject it, right? You are updating your views in line with the information, even though you don't like it. And that's what I that's what I really want you to understand from this key idea number two is that yes, people dislike dislike things that are counterattitudinal, but no, they don't reject the inf information; they update in direction of it. All right, so let me give you a summary of those predictions. Persuasion in parallel is about studying the effect of persuasive information on a target policy attitude, and my claim is that that's positive for all groups. That's the main That's the main claim. If you're looking at group cues, then we have oppositely signed treatment effects. It'll be positive for people who are in the in-group and negative for people who are in the out-group. As I said, I think there's interesting boundaries uh, to that to that question that we as social scientists need to need to map out. What about the effects of persuasive information on those affective evaluations, these are gonna be oppositely signed. It'll be positive for people who are have 
who are policy proponents, and they will be negative for people who are policy opponents. We really can't get this and this confused. This fourth group is very odd. Like, what's the affective evaluation of a group Q? Imagine you're like watching a newscaster who tells you, ah, the Republicans support policy X. Like, you're not really going to update your views about that newscaster. So it's just a weird, it's just a weird uh, fourth category. And there are no experiments that I'm aware of that investigate it. So it's just on the plot, plot because it, it it is the intersection of those of that treatment and that um, and that outcome. But it's not of particular interest to us today. Let me talk now about the politics implications of that of that typology. This is the most important one. Persuasive information works to change people's minds in the direction of information a little bit, but it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of them disliking you, right? And so if you are trying to, if you try to change someone's mind, it'll work a little bit, but they'll be angry at you, okay? In fact, you'll know that it's working when they get angry. Right, so effective persuasion will seem to to, to backfire uh, in the sense that people get angry. Um, so I was I was scrolling through my TikTok uh, uh, yesterday, and um, uh, one of the Congress people here, uh, AOC, was like, "If you're out there trying to make change, and the haters are coming for you, um, don't stop. That's how you know that you're that's how you know that you're doing it right." And it's like, wow, I don't know how AOC, how you knew uh, so well what <laughs> about this, this point because it's kind of subtle but it's absolutely right so she's right about that that um when you try to convince people you will be effective and yet they will be mad at you okay for a long time people have been confusing that the negative affective response that people have for saying that you've ended up further apart than when you started ah this persuasive attempt was counterproductive and that's just this misunderstanding of the effects on Y2. Those negative effects on affective evaluations, you can't, you can't avoid that. Like that's just the way that it goes. People have a negative response to being persuaded. Um, you can of course sugarcoat things, right? So, you know, many news channels have learned this where they package things that are not palatable in nice packages so that you are you don't dislike it quite so much. You can do other things to make people like you. There are many books on like how to be persuasive at work or how to, you know, and those are not really about, you know, what arguments work best for different people. It's about how do you make people like you? How do you make it so that they are not as angry at you? Um, and I think that that's, you know, weirdly, that's right. Um, it's It's mistaking persuasion for making people like you, but it definitely can can be, um, you can offset the affective costs with sugarcoating. If you're trying to persuade people on the other side, um, don't use group cues, right? So group cues will cause people to go in opposite directions. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's not, that's not what you want to do. So uh, uh, many politicians who are doing their campaign advertisements, they have already learned this in some way, like, uh, in the U.S., when you're like a, a TV ads run by Congress people, almost never in, use partisan labels. Like they don't remind people of what party they are a member of, and that's because they understand that will have oppositely signed, oppositely signed treatment effects. I don't know that if all I don't know that all members of of our political communication establishment have understood this. Group cues are absolutely part of how we talk about politics. And this has um, polarizing, um, polarizing effects. And if you want to be persuasive, you want to avoid, avoid those group cues. Um, many campaigns try to target the people they think are going to be persuadable. So so-called swing voters in the middle. And I think this is misguided in the sense that everyone is a little bit persuadable, right? And so you might be missing out on people whose minds you could change if you are targeting too narrowly to people who are in the middle. Like a vote that comes from taking people from 90% support to 91% support, that counts just as well as going from taking someone from 10% support to 11% support, right? So that targeting 
is is possibly misguided. Now, there are times when um, the amount of persuasion that you're doing is too small to make someone go from being an opposition person to being a supporter, right? And so where, when you're, when the thing is right at that cut point between supporting and not supporting, maybe it makes sense to find people who are at that cut point. And so for that reason, you might want to target. Um, but the standard ex explanations of like, well, those people are not persuadable because they're already convinced or they're unconvincible. And it's just the people in the middle that we need to target. I think that's, uh, I think that's misguided. There's some research design implications of this. Uh, one is that you can't just ask people to rate treatments to understand their persuasiveness. How persuasive do you think this will be? You're not going to get the right answer because people don't know that, right? Uh, you, you can't use ratings to, to, to judge persuasiveness. Um, since I've been out here trying to tell people that um, the effects of treatments are mostly homogeneous, people have come at me with counterexamples. Uh, and that happened, and I'm, and I look forward to that. I think it's great that people are coming at me with counterexamples. But a lot of times, the treatment ends up actually being more of a group cue, and so then that doesn't count. And sometimes it ends up being an affective evaluation outcome, and that doesn't count either. And so, really, what I'm trying to say is that this, these distinctions are important for understanding how people respond to 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 information. So these are not counterexamples, in my opinion. Counterexamples could actually, could easily happen, right? Like go do an experiment where it's really a persuasive treatment, a persuasive information treatment, and show oppositely signed treatment effects, uh, then I, you know, then that would be an exception. Um, I just, uh, we don't see that. We don't see that. All right, the last point. Now, this is a, a theoretical point that matters especially for political science theory and less for politics. So if you're less interested in political science theory, you don't have to pay attention to this part. Um, but if, um, but this is the, this is how, what I've been talking about so far. So, so the previous section was about how it matters for politics and this is how it matters for our, our theories of how people understand uh, political information. Motivated reasoning theory is a large body of theory that is uh, that presupposes that people have motivations and that they use those motivations to arrive at um, particular attitudes. In particular, you are supposed to have accuracy goals on the one hand and directional goals on the other. So an accuracy goal is trying to arrive at the correct answer that's you're motivated to get the correct answer. You're trying to arrive at the right policy attitude. The directional goal is trying to arrive at a particular policy. Like you have, in order to protect your group identity, what you're gonna to try to do is reason your way to finding out that you, that you hold that attitude, right? So that's a directional goal. These two things are supposed to interact with what happens when you encounter persuasive information. So depending on your directional goals and your accuracy goals, information will have a different effect. So this expression is to say, well, let's talk about, let's just write, write it a little differently. What is the effect of counter attitudinal information? That's the interesting case. So whatever directional motivation you have, and whatever accuracy motivation you have, the only thing that's going to change in this expression is whether or not you get that counterattitudinal information. This expression is going to be positive if your accuracy goals dominate. If your accuracy goals are the things that matter more for you, then when you get that information, you're going to update in the direction of information. But if the directional goals are the things that dominate, then the effect of that information will be negative. That's the claim of motivated reasoning. But I just told you the, the persuasion in parallel pattern is common, right? And if you agree with me that the persuasion in parallel pattern is common, then you have to you have to conclude either accuracy goals always dominate, or motivated reasoning theory is not a great model of of political information processing, right? So this is a little bit. I'm not really being honest here. Like nobody, no, none of the motivated reasoning theorists think this. They don't think that accuracy goals always dominate. That's the reason why they built the theory, right? So that that's just to say it's a little bit um, 
I am obviously on this side of the argument. I don't think it's a particularly good model of information processing. But again, I'm not able to show that the whole theory is wrong. It's just that this particular particular prediction isn't right. You might say, but isn't aren't there studies that show that motivated reasoning is right? Like, isn't that what they what those people did? Is that they demonstrated that those that those theories are correct? And what I want to tell you is, and this is where it ties back into research design, that the research designs that those those studies used were were weak. So I'm going to just briefly um, briefly explain how it is that those studies were were weak. The first one is a paper by Lord Ross and Lepper. In 1979, they brought four, 48 Stanford undergraduates into the lab. Half of them were pro-capital punishment. Half of them were anti-capital punishment. They showed them a bundle of information and then asked them, how, if at all, did your attitude change on the scale from negative eight to eight? Proponents said that their attitudes became more pro by 1.5 scale points, and opponents said that their attitudes became less pro by negative 1.7 scale points. So this is oppositely signed effects, or so it seems. But you can't just ask somebody what their effect is. You can't just ask for their treatment effect. That requires like introspection into your soul to know what your counterfactual attitude would have been had you seen the other information, right? This is not something that subjects can do. It doesn't take advantage of anything like a random assignment to information in order to figure out what the effective information is. So when my co-author Andy Guess and I read this in grad school, we lost our minds. We're like, this is not how you learn the answer to this question. So we, we did a replication study where we embedded exactly this condition in a random assignment study so that we could compare what happens now in 2018 if you analyze the data exactly as Lord Ross and Lepper did, we also get that crazy finding. Proponents say that they became 2.7 skill points more pro, and opponents became 2.7 skill points less pro. But that's ridiculous. It's not, we're not supposed to ask, but when we just analyze it according to the random assignment, we see exactly parallel lines again, right? So the problem here is the is this measurement is that people are not able to tell you what the causal effects of things are. Instead, they report the level of their opinion. When you ask people, how well or poorly do you think this study was conducted? So that's the, an affective evaluation outcome. This is where you get an X. This is where the proponents think that the pro study was really well done and the con study was very badly done. Whereas the opponents think the con study was well done and the pro study was very poorly done. Right, so this is this is what people were thinking when they're talking about people rejecting information. Is that they give negative evaluations? Yes, they do give negative evaluations, but they nevertheless are updated in the right direction. Right, so that's just to say that this study doesn't show what it claims to show, and when you fix it, you get the persuasion and parallel finding. I'm gonna skip this last study and instead I'm gonna sum up. I tried to get three key ideas across in this talk. And the first one is that the persuasion and parallel pattern is common. I'm trying to make a general claim that what normally happens is that people update their views in the direction of information and it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter what your background is you update a small amount in the direction of information. And even though you dislike it, when it's kind of attitudinal, you still update in the direction of information. This second key idea is distinguishing between two kinds of treatments, persuasive information and group cues versus on, on the treatment side. And then on the outcome side, I wanna distinguish between policy attitudes and affective evaluations. Keeping these two separate lets you understand that important trade-off that yes, you can change minds, but it comes at a political, uh, an affective cost. We all have to like manage where we are on that trade-off, like at dinner with your family, you might want to change their minds on something, but they would be mad at you if you did, right? <laughs> so, and we sometimes avoid, uh, avoid that conflict, even though it would be a little bit effective. Right. And so that that same trade off is happening in the political arena. 
And the last one is this theory point that one theory of mind is called motivated reasoning. And I don't think that a major prediction of that theory holds up. It makes me worry about the theory in general, but I am not offering an alternative. Um, and there are frustrating research design reasons for that. It's very hard to come up with a theory of what's happening in people's minds. All I can really do is show that when I present people with persuasive information, this is how their responses change. And so then I, I'm not drawing extra inferences about what's going on in between. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I've got for you. I'd be happy to take your comments and questions. Great, thank you so much. What a fascinating talk um, and lots of uh, information to process there. Um, so we can open it up for some audience Q&A. Um, if anybody has a question, please feel free to raise your hands and we can call on you um, to have some discussion. Um, if you are particularly shy, you can also just enter your question onto the chat box and um, I will do my best to moderate those questions. And I know people take a while to formulate their questions. so. I will, as we're waiting, um, I will uh, throw out the first question, um, which I was very intrigued by your, um, this idea of um, when you were talking about AOC and sort of how, how it actually works um, and how a lot of, uh, you, and you kind of mentioned after that, the idea of polarization and sort of how politicians or people may not pur purposely will not say you know democrats believe this or republicans believe this but it seems like nowadays there are certain people who purposely use group cues to incite polarization uh and and to sort of cause that divergent effect um is that am i understanding that correctly in terms of your research and sort of the implication for for what our political situation looks like now at least in the u.s Yes. So I, I think that it is, um, it's just quite clear that many politicians are dividing up the U.S. especially into um, camps. And they're saying um, those Democrats are horrible and stupid and we Republicans are great or vice versa. And that their goal is not at all to um, persuade the other side of their policy positions. Instead, they are presumably trying to seek re-election, and they think that that's a good strategy. Um, those districts are ones where it's very difficult for one or the other party to win, and so they don't pay the electoral cost of failing to persuade the other side, um, and so they they are free to, to, to use those group cues. Um, to forward other objectives beyond trying to change the minds of other people, right? So persuasion is not usually, <laughs> is not always the goal of, of, of elected politicians. With respect to the AOC's comment, I, it, it was just poignant for me to, when, she, when, to, to hear her say, whenever you're out there trying to affect change in the world, when you're successful, the haters come for you. And it's not evidence that you're doing a bad job, right? Uh, no, instead, it's evidence that uh, when you try to persuade people, they get angry about it. That's so interesting. So do you, uh, so with these groups or these people who are purposely inciting polarization, do you feel like that's, like, are they just, or do they actually like have this data and like are purposely like, you know, doing this? Or is this something that just sort of they intuitively like feel like doing? That's fascinating. I, so I, I, what, one thing I can tell you is um, many politicians have now turned towards survey experimentation to test their messages. Um, so it is commonplace now for, it, it used to be that social scientists were the ones who were like, oh, we've got random assignment. We can learn about the world through experimentation. And what would campaigns would be relying on focus groups or just their own intuition or campaign consultants to like come up with their messages. Nowadays, they have switched to a model where they'll obtain like four or five messages, 
send them off to a company that runs a survey experiment, and then they get back the ones that they um, that they pick the best performing one in that survey experiment. One kind of cool wrinkle is that one of those companies um, made a condition of using their services that the data would be made available to academics. So now we have like this huge treasure trove of, of what those campaign experiments are up to. Um, that, so that is to say that it is possible that the political establishment has learned what we now have learned from these experiments. Um, I don't think that that really explains uh, some of the comments that you like from Marjorie Taylor Greene or stuff like that. Like, I don't think that she's thinking that way. Uh, but it is true that some campaigns have have become the social scientist. You know, I see a question here in the chat. Hi, since persu the persuasion of parallel is common, does it mean that having a proper way to expression, even with different people, can work well as each other? So that's a great question. That's a really great question. I understand this question to be, okay, so suppose that you believe me that given a particular treatment, everyone responds the same. I have a I my problem is still picking what do I say to people, right? And which treatments are more or less effective. So this book is not about that. Um, so that's just to say, you have pointed out here that it's still totally possible that some treatments are more effective than others. Some things that you say won't be effective, some things that you say will be effective. How can you know which ones are which? I don't know. I don't know how to, 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 to tell you that. One thing that I can say is when I was just describing that treasure trove of experiments where campaigns have tried out just hundreds and hundreds of messages. And now, so now we have experiments that test those. The average effect across all of them is about a 0 0.8 percentage point effect on vote choice. So it's very small, very small effect on vote choice. Then you ask, well, how much better is the best one than the average? How much how much worse is the worst one than the average? The standard deviation is about 0.4 percentage points. So like an ad that's 50% better than the average, it's about 1.2 points. An ad that is 50% worse than the average is about eh, 0.4 points. Right? That is just to say that the amount of difference that we're talking about from really good ones to average ones to really bad ones is, is pretty small. Uh, so that's to say, the thing to probably think about more is, what are the things that you can do to make it so that people will listen to you, right? So it's not so much the thing that you deliver once they're listening, it's all of the stuff that you need to do in order to get their attention, uh, that that really makes a difference. And that kind of stuff is going to depend on what kind of person you are. Right, so different kinds of people will pay different attention depending on what they think about you. Um, so anyway, that's my that's that's a long-winded answer to say I don't really know, but the differences are small, and the main thing that you need to be concerned about is how do you get people to listen. Um, I'm going to piggyback off that. A lot of people in the audience um, are kind of coming from a more business um, right. pr perspective, and so a lot of the questions sort of revolve around, uh, you know, most of your examples, I think, are more kind of policy oriented, or at least politics or anything. So are there implications? Does this ac apply across like, like different domains and different? Uh, uh, yeah. Sectors? So like the standard business setting is going to be, what is the appeal that will make you buy the product? Right? And here, there is extremely good evidence of heterogeneity, right? Um, there is There are ads that have different effects on purchasing behavior. And that there are, um, like, like, there's good evidence that if you target your ad to the right audience, you will get them to buy. Whereas if you were to target the same ad to a different audience, you would not get them to buy. And that's because what the advertisements are doing is informing you of what your choices are, right? Uh, and so it's only the people who would be who would want that thing that are ever going to buy. And then what you're trying to do is you're solving an information problem. I'm not a business school professor. I'm sure it's much more complicated than that. But that is the essential difference uh, with 
politics. Here, we are not trying to match consumers with products. Instead, we've got policies that we're trying to increase or decrease support for. So it's a, it's a very different choice setting, which is why, by the way, like, the advertisements to which we are all exposed are algorithmically determined. The advertisements that I get are going to be very different from the advertisements that you get. And that's because they make a lot more money when they do it that way. And they have learned that through direct experimentation. So there's wild heterogeneity in the effects of advertising appeals on purchasing behavior. Uh, the same is just not true for trying to change people's minds about things. Great. Um, any last questions from anybody in the audience? All right. Well, if not, uh, thank you Great. so much, Alex, for a fascinating talk. Um, and yeah. I'm sure that uh, people do actually have questions. And so, um, please. Zoom is an odd platform. It's totally fine. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for listening. In any case, I really appreciate it. It's great talking to you all. Um, so be be on the lookout for the book um, and um, Persuasion in Parallel. And um, there it is. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Alex, again, for a fascinating talk. And um, we'll see everybody next time. All right. Bye-bye.